So, without further ado, I would like to welcome on stage the first speaker of tonight, Mike Lee. some videos so that you don't have to just awkwardly stare at me the whole time. <laughs> Always nice. And then, uh, of course, I wouldn't be me if I didn't have my camera hat. So. There you go. In case you're curious how you get a, a, an Apple badge uh, with you dressed as a pirate, the answer is you just show up for your first day of work at Apple dressed like a pirate. It would be simpler. <laughs> Uh, so, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about Amsterdam and about what I'm calling uh, the new way, the new way of doing things, because uh, today was the sort of grand opening of our Amsterdam headquarters, uh, which is uh, relevant to you because it's a place where you can come any day of the week, bring your laptop, get some work done, meet some people, uh, for absolutely free. Uh, it's just, it's our place to do business, but we have lots of room and we like app makers and we like bringing app makers together. And so we say, uh, if you're interested in apps at all, whether your background is nerdy stuff or non-nerdy stuff or business stuff or, or, or whatever, uh, you want to meet some people, you want to talk about apps, you want to meet some other nerds, uh, you know, even for dating, who knows? Uh, <laughs> come on by, that's at the Westerhaus Fabrik, uh, and it's open, yeah, like I said, it's open uh, as of today. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on who I am, uh, some of the stuff that I've done. Uh, why I feel qualified to be up here uh, telling you how you should live your life. So that's me, and I, I started my life in the enterprise. I worked for an airline. Um, the fun thing was I, I, I had a job lifting stuff for a living, and that was my job. And uh, it was a very dangerous job, and uh, you know the kind of thing where you get hurt all the time. And so I had to figure out a way that I could continue to live my life in a less dangerous way. And I got a piece of advice, which was, it's called skilled labor, look into it. Uh, which was a rude way of putting a, a very good piece of advice, which, you know, is, it's good to have skills, it's good to know things, it's good to, uh, to be in demand, especially when the market turns. Uh, I took that and I said, you know, I really want to make applications for people, I really want to make stuff for the Macintosh. And so I went and I did an apprenticeship at a company called Delicious Monster in Seattle uh, for three years. And then the iPhone came out and so I went to Silicon Valley, I started a company called Tapulous, we made a game called Tap Tap Revenge, uh, 30 million downloads, and that was acquired by Disney. So I had that, that vaunted successful exit that, uh, that, that entrepreneurs like to dream about. Then I started another company called United Lemur, uh, which wasn't really around for very long, uh, but we did manage to contribute to the Obama iPhone app, so that was cool. Uh, you know, when you ever get into a pissing match with someone, it's nice to be able to say, I wrote the president's fucking iPhone app. Anyway, then I went to go work for Big Fruit in Cupertino, uh, that was awesome, as you can imagine. I learned lots of secrets, most of which I can't tell you. Uh, when I spent a year just traveling the world, uh, I, I read about this guy, uh, Paul Herdos, who was this Hungarian mathematician, and he was, uh, he was basically homeless, and he would just go around, show up at the doorstep of some colleague somewhere, and be like, uh, hey, I'm gonna sleep on your couch, and we're gonna collaborate on some papers. And uh, he actually was the most, uh, he was like the most published mathematician of all time, where he wrote more papers than anyone because that's all he did, he just worked and, 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 and bummed around, so I thought, let's try doing that for a year. Um, and I did that, and I looked for a, a, you know, where I was gonna work, and what I was gonna do, and where I was gonna live, and I decided that Amsterdam seemed like a really nice place uh, to live, and really easy for Americans to get to. Uh, and I, I worked at a company called uh, Sofa, which made Mac apps uh, for about a month, it was an awesome month, really cool guys, uh, known them for years, and then they got bought up by Facebook. And uh, it's like, would you like to go uh, basically to 30 meters from your old office in Palo Alto and work at another Valley company? There's a big pile of pre-IPO stock. Say, no, that sounds boring. <laughs> um, I've already done that. So instead, I, I, I started uh, Amsterdam. And that was that was about a year ago. That was uh, April 20th uh, of last year when we announced uh, that we we're that we we're doing the whole Amsterdam thing. And uh, just you know, to make it easy to talk about Amsterdam, let's get this right off the bat. Uh, we have this thing called Web 2.0, and we invented this in like 05. Uh, and apparently no one in this country has heard of this idea, so let me give you a real, just real life lesson of Web 2.0. Uh, it means that your URLs mean whatever you want them to. Like, that's a real simple definition. So when we say Amsterdam.rs, we don't mean uh, we're down with Serbia. 
what we mean is we're the Amsterdamers, right? That's what that means. And the reason for that is because Amsterdam.nl would say that we're, we're in some Dutch company, right? And we're certainly here, uh, it's in the name, uh, but that's not who we are, right? That's not, that's not the top level of our, of our dominion. Uh, we're definitely not uh, .com, because we're not commercial, and we're not .org, because we're not American. We're a worldwide organization. Uh, we're about the people, we're a community. Uh, we're the Amsterdamers, that's why we have .rs. Uh, and our Twitter account reflects that, Amsterdam RS. Uh, there are some other guys, they like to use our name, they're not us. Uh, so this is us, Amsterdam RS. What is Amsterdam? Let me give you a real simple explanation of what Amsterdam is. I'm gonna tell you what the idea was that led to Amsterdam. I go to a lot of conferences, I speak at a lot of conferences, and conferences are awesome, because you get to be surrounded by people who are like you. You get to be surrounded by people who like to talk about the stuff that you like to talk about. And that's what makes a conference great. It's not, you know, the speakers. The speakers are, 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 are okay. It's the drinks, it's the meeting people, it's the networking. You know, that's the thing that makes a conference fantastic. You walk around feeling so much smarter, so much faster than you were before, so inspired, bouncing ideas off of each other. You know, when you're sitting there having a conversation with someone and the person you know, who's at the table next to you leans over and is like, I'm sorry, I couldn't help but overhear the conversation you were talking about. I happen to be doing research in this area. You know, these are the kinds of conversations that you, you love to have. Right? That's what you do at a conference, that's what you get in a place like Silicon Valley. And so that was the idea. It should be like having a conference all the time, right? It should be like there's a conference in Amsterdam every day of the week. And so what we did was we, we, we put up a, a, a sort of a social infrastructure so that every single Wednesday, we get together and we get some drinks. Old West, Cafe Bucks, 7 p.m. every Wednesday. Get together, have some drinks, meet some people. Uh, every Wednesday at lunchtime, we have a lecture, come get some free food and listen to somebody get up and talk. To back that, we have a speaker bureau where you can get training on how to, on how to do speaking. You can actually get up on stage and, and you know, we'll, we'll connect you to all of these different uh, conferences and stuff so that you can uh, you know, get out there and start uh, talking about your interests and the things that you're into in a way that will actually help promote yourself and your career. Um, but then we also say, you know, there's a lot of uh, non-booze related uh, getting together that can be done. And so every other weekend we get together and we go do something, we call them the family weekends because it's like you can bring your whole family if you want to and we go, you know, like last week we went on a walking tour of Utrecht, for example. Uh, sometimes we get together and play board games. You know, it's all about just getting together uh, and supporting each other. And of course, the, the, the big misconception is that it's like an Apple club or an engineer's club uh, but it's really not. And, and the whole thing about Amsterdam, you know, we have this idea in, in, in Amsterdam of tolerance, right? That's a word that we like here. We like to tolerate each other. Just tolerate each other. Uh, we like to take that a little farther and talk about collaborating with each other. Uh, but the whole idea is that when we talk about app makers, we're not talking about engineers. We're not talking about Apple. We're talking about people who love apps, people who are into technology, people who are into the future. Because if you want to build a successful app company, Yes, you're going to need engineers, you're going to need designers, you're going to need all kinds of creative people, you're going to need business people, you're going to need lawyers, you're going to need marketeers, you're going to need philosophers, academics, you're going to need all kinds of different people, depending on the type of company that you're building. And so there is no one type of person. There is no one platform, there is no one culture, there is no one language. It's all about people getting together from different backgrounds, whatever it is that they're into, and talking to each other, meeting each other. It's just like, forming these human relationships. You know, you, 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 it's all about getting to know each other. It's all about finding places where your passions happen to coincide or match in, in an excellent way. And forming those relationships is really, that's the basis of entrepreneurship. That's the basis of a place like Silicon Valley. And that's the basis of something like Amsterdam, bringing everybody together in the middle. And helping each other out. I mean, this is the big thing about Amsterdam. Yes, there's a foundation called Amsterdam. Yes, there's a, a location in the world called Amsterdam. But really, it's a community of people. Amsterdam is the people, right? When we're talking about the people who, who, who build apps, when we talk about the people who believe in values like collaboration, uh, in values like getting along with each other, uh, that's, that's, that's Amsterdam. So all of this becomes very important, especially here in Amsterdam, where Amsterdam is based, although we have offices all over the world. We call them embassies. We're opening up a, a bunch more. We have a bunch already. Um, but there's dark times ahead, not just in Europe, but the whole world. Like, I don't know if you've noticed outside, but uh, it's kind of scary, like the news. A lot of stuff going on. 
uh, a lot of stuff. And uh, we, I think, and when I say we, I mean, you know, we the people in this room, we the, 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 the people who get together and talk about fixing the world's problems, we are, we are key uh, in these dark times. And, uh, you know, we can, we can, you know, we can ignore them, but that's not going to do us any good. It's better to get ready for them. It's better to look for the opportunities. And so when I, I look at the future and I see dark clouds, I say, let Amsterdam be as a bright, shining beacon to this economy, to this world, to all of these things. Let us find the opportunities in these challenges. I'll give you an example, a real sterling example. Anti-intellectualism is on the rise in the world today, uh, in general. We don't get that much going on here in the Netherlands because we're a pretty educated population here. But in other places, the United States, for example, man, the, 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 the tone uh, in the public discourse when it comes to, uh, to intellectual pursuit, when it comes to science, uh, it's frightening. It, it, it's, it's actually frightening. And when this kind of thing goes on, and it, and it does, I mean, it, this happens from time to time. Uh, you have a situation where you have a society, that society has a lot of inequality, uh, that inequality causes civil disturbances, the government says we need to distract the people from this, and they start appealing to patriotism, and they start rattling sabers around the world. This is not a new strategy, we've seen this before. And we've seen anti-intellectualism, we've seen the results of this. When that happens, you either have a diaspora, and the intellectuals flee, and you have a dark age, or everyone goes to some new place, and you have a reawakening. When Constantinople fell at the end of the Holy Roman Empire, the intellectuals, they grabbed their scrolls and they all headed to Florence and they started the Renaissance. When fascism rolled across Europe in the 30s, the intellectuals of Europe fled to the United States and gave them their golden half century. And now the anti-intellectualism is finding its way rolling across the United States. Where are their intellectuals going to go? I spent a year traveling and talking to all of these people. and. They were all thinking about leaving, but they were all thinking about leaving to different places. And so the big realization was, well, let's all get together in the same place. Why scatter? Let's go to a place where it's still friendly to people like us who like to think about things, where it's still friendly to people uh, you know, who like to talk about science and research and, and, and fixing things and uh, you know, not, not giving up on the world or, or, or just descending into, into pure selfishness. Uh, let's all get together in one place where we can work on the world's problems even as the darkness comes. And that really was, you know, that's, that's the idea behind Amsterdam. We make it a comfortable place, we make it easy for intellectuals to come here, uh, we make it easy for computers to <laughs> malfunction. Ew. Graceful under pressure, this is what we teach. <laughs> so what does it mean? What does it mean when scary things start happening and people start feeling uncomfortable in the place where they live? What it means is that we can be that bright shining beacon. We can attract those people here. We can say, bring your knowledge, bring your skills, uh, bring your computers, and come here. And then when those people come here, we will not just have them here, uh, but we will also have an entire infrastructure set up for them so that people who are here can learn from them, and people who want to learn from them can come here to learn from them. We like to say that Amsterdam is not just the best place in the world to be an app maker, it is the best place in the world to become an app maker. And so, if we can then take that anti-intellectualism and turn them into a technical labor surplus by bringing the smart people here and using them to train the many, many smart people who are already here, to train them in this new app economy that has contributed half a million jobs to the American economy since 2007, right? This bright, shining beacon in the economy, this, this artisanal economy of people doing things for themselves. And when we talk to entrepreneurs and we ask them, what are your biggest challenges? The biggest challenge everywhere in the world, no matter who you talk to, it's always talent, it's always getting the people, right? It's always, there aren't enough engineers in this town, right? Well, by building a technical labor surplus, we've already solved the biggest problem. And then you say, well, what's the second biggest problem? And that really, I find that really varies according to where you are. In the States, for example, find an entrepreneur and ask them what their second biggest problem is, and they'll probably tell you something about currency offshore and a tax shelter that they'd like to bring over. That's, that's the big thing now in the States. 
Uh, but here, what people will talk about is the lack of an exit infrastructure. They will talk about the lack of investment dollars. They will talk about the fact that once you have a successful company, if you want that company to grow, if you want the investment, you're gonna to have to move to Silicon Valley. If you want to be acquired, if you want an IPO, if you want to exit, you're going to have to go to Silicon Valley. That's what they will tell you. And that's what they will tell you is lacking here. Um, I'm gonna tell you right now, I think that's bullshit. Nice echo on the word bullshit. Thank you for that. Uh, this, this idea that we need an exit infrastructure uh, to build some kind of entrepreneurial uh, location here, it's just crap. And it's crap because Silicon Valley did not start because there was an exit infrastructure, right? Silicon Valley did not start in 1971 when Kleiner Perkins opened up their first office on Sand Hill Road. That was just the catalyst. Silicon Valley started when the kids of a bunch of radar technicians sat in their parents' garages working on cool shit for no other reason than it was cool shit, right? Working on things to change the world because they were picking drugs and they were young and that's what you did, right? You tried to change the world, there was cool new technology and that's what they were building. And so when the money came to the valley, there were already all of these cool projects out there, all of these cool teams that were formed. And that's where the technology came from. And so people who look at this problem backwards, they say, you know, London, Northern Ireland, you know, all of these places. All we have to do is just get a big pool of money together, and then everybody will want the money, and they'll all come here. And that's true. What you will attract are a bunch of hungry mosquitoes who smell blood and are ready to suck up some of that money, because that's what happens. Instead, what you have to create, you have to create a place of true innovation. Because the reality is, the money needs us more than we need the money. There is way more money in the world than there is stuff to invest money in. That's why we get these bubbles. That's why we get things like the housing bubble. It's because there's all this money and nothing to invest it in, right? When, 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 when the best investments in the world are paying less than 1% and you can't even keep up with inflation, what are you going to do with all of your money? You're going to desperately stuff it into any investment you can find. So the money is out there. And once we actually have the people here, once we actually have the projects here, the teams here, then the money will find us. And so we need to not worry about that so much. The exit infrastructure or lack thereof, that is not our biggest problem. The biggest problem that we have here is idea people. Idea people are a poison. They are a cancer. Let me tell you what an idea person is. An idea person is somebody who says, I come up with ideas. Somebody else does the work, we split the money. What that is, that is a 50% tax on entrepreneurship. Because show me the entrepreneur, show me the team that doesn't have an idea, that's just sitting there. We, we've got a big pile of money, we've got a bunch of smart people. Oh, if only we had an idea we could build something. <laughs> that, that team has never existed. On the other hand, people who have ideas, who are just looking for people to build those ideas for them, Boy, I could throw a rock and hit one, and then the rock would bounce off and hit another person. Like, I, I don't know what it is. We need to get over this misconception that work is for poor people, right? The number of people, so, you know, because of the whole exit infrastructure thing, one of the first things we did when we started Amsterdam was we got a fund together, right? We said, we're going to get some VCs together, we're going to pull them, and we're going to have, a, you know, if you have a great team, if you have a great idea, if you have something that you've built that is ready to take it to the next level and, and build a company and, and, and actually, you know, start some growth going on here, we have that fund. We have these, you know, 50,000 euro parcels that we'll give you to get you started. And so we spent six months listening to person after person after person come in and say things like, well, I would never write the code myself, but... I borrowed some money and I, 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 I paid a bunch of Ukrainians to write the code for me and now uh, yeah, we're so close, I just need you know, somebody to help finish it and get it over the finish line. And it's like, there's no finish line, there's a starting line. And that's the line you're almost to. And the fact that you have a bunch of you know, code that you've just paid some strangers to write for you means that you have nothing. You've spent a bunch of money. You know, it, it, successful companies, they have two things in common. They have great teams and they have inexplicable pivots, right? If you have a great team who's actually building stuff, you can change entirely the company that you're trying to, to make. You can take your podcasting company and turn it into a social network, right? That's, that's, that's where Twitter comes from. You can take your uh, massive multiplayer uh, uh, online game and turn it into a photo sharing service. That's where Flickr comes from, right? 
The world of successful entrepreneurship is a world that is full of tales of people having to change their entire strategy. And changing your entire strategy means having the ability to pivot. If you have to spend money, ship money off to Ukraine or India every time you need to try to pivot, you're going to either be paralyzed or, 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 or broke. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to run out of money. Uh, you're going to be afraid to spend money. Uh, you're, you're going to fail. Whereas if you have a great team, uh, the products will follow. And if you have a, a, a flop of a product, the team can survive. Uh, they, they, they can. They can do something else. Uh, you can deal with these things. But not if all you've got is an idea and a bunch of money. It's a, it's a huge threat. Uh, and you know where this really comes into play, we see this a lot in, in the technology policy of the city. Uh, if you had to describe you know, this idea of Building a technology hub in Europe, here in Amsterdam, it's not new. We didn't invent this idea. This idea has been around for, I've heard people say 15 years at this point, where the city's been talking about, oh, we're the new tech hub of Europe, and everyone's just like, sure, Europe. And, 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 and it doesn't happen, right? And it doesn't happen because, you know, not because we're not trying. I mean, the government has spent God knows how many millions of euros on, on things to try to turn this into a, into a technology center, uh, but they don't seem to work. They don't seem to work because they're, they're very top down. You know, they're people who just basically, they know how to get politically in with the government. They know how to get money. They know how to get money into their own pockets for throwing, you know, terrible events that nobody's interested in and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and that's where our city's technology budget has gone. Uh, some good stuff, you know, there, there's some great stuff in the city uh, that's been sponsored by public dollars, but there's a lot of crap. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of crap, no results, no data, uh, you know, no, no idea why anybody thought it would work, right? And the success that we've had in the past year, you know, we've had an influence on the city that, you know, like has never been seen before. And that all comes because we're, we're data-driven, you know, we, we profile the community the same way we, we profile slow code. We take measurements, we generate data, we, we apply, you know, theories, we look at the effects of, you know, how, how well that actually worked, uh, we come up with conclusions, we share that data, uh, you know, it's all very scientific because that's, that's how we operate. And we think that it would be, well, and frankly, it would just be immoral to take public funding without actually having data to prove what you're doing with it. Like, that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that has to change. Uh, we as technologists, we have to demand better. We have to drive technology in this city. We have to make the government listen to us uh, and make sure that they know uh, what does and doesn't work for us, and who we are and who we aren't. Uh, we have to take charge of this. We cannot, we cannot kick back and wait for this city to become a technology hub. We make this a technology hub by building technology here. Um, so technology policy, that has to change. Our goal ultimately is not to build another Silicon Valley. Um, it would be a waste of time to try to copy somebody else's work. Uh, we would produce at best a copy. But what we can try to do instead in the process of reverse engineering the valley, we can actually build a valley that is better, that is flatter, that is rounder, right? A valley where we have a more diverse mix of people. A valley where it's not a valley at all. I mean, to me, what makes the valley the valley are the steep walls, right? And the, the steep walls of the valley are the financial institutions, are the VC, are the, the banks. It's the house. And all these creative people go in there, and they just get chewed up. It's like a casino floor. And every once in a while, somebody hits a jackpot, and you have their picture on the news, and we all know their, their names. But for the most part, we just get eaten up, and the house always wins. And that's why, and after that, we mix everybody together. We say, you know, hey, you're a VC? This guy's a programmer. You guys should get, get together and talk. You should get to know each other. You should start a business together. We should start these things together and not have this separation that leads to the creation of institutions, that leads to the creation of a house. Right? We need to bring things down a notch from the insanity of the valley. I mean, there's uh, you know, this, this, this apocryphal story that goes around at Apple uh, during the bring up of you know, one of these iOS SDKs. One of the managers you know, told his team who were work, working frantically, somebody said, you know, I have a family. And they said, we will buy you a new family. <laughs> and that's kind of funny, but it's also kind of horrifying. Right? Because it's true. Because that's the way that it is there. Um, and that's too much, right? And maybe here we went too far in the other direction and we're a little too lazy. Uh, somewhere in the middle, 
Uh, if we can calm the Americans down, if we can kick the Europeans in the ass, somewhere in the middle, I think, is, is the perfect culture uh, of entrepreneurship and, and, and creation. Uh, and that's, that's what we're seeking. Uh, we're seeking something that is not a valley per se, uh, but something that is flat and round, uh, like a pancake. <laughs> and that is Amsterdam, that is the new way, and I'll be happy to, uh, to take any questions I have time for. Thank you very much, Mike. Are there any questions for Mike? And if there are, I can give you my mic, because we only have one. Your organization is, is data driven and you're checking how, how well you are doing. Could you name some examples of what's your data and, and how are you how are you looking at that? Yeah, I mean, I can give you a, a, a real tangible example. Uh, we actually have uh, started a, a research project with the UVA. Uh, and what we're doing is we're mapping all of the technology in the city. So not just for our own stuff, but just in general. Who's producing technology in the city? Where in the city are they, are they producing it? Uh, if you go into places like New York, you know, which is very keen on their entrepreneurs, uh, they have a very beautiful map that shows you know, these nice little bubbles of technology in the city. We need something that's even better than that. We need something where you can see over time how technology shifts and ebbs and flows in the city. Right? Once we have uh, that data, and, and at this point I should say we have the data, we're working on the visualization section of it, uh, then we'll be able to show year over year uh, technology changing in the city, not just uh, in a you know strictly statistical way, but also sending people you know sociologists to get to know these people, to ask them who are you, what are you working on, why, why are you here, right? We keep track of, for example, when people move here to the city because of Amsterdam, we keep track of that, right? So I can tell you, for example, the last person to move here uh, was a guy who moved here I think uh, four days ago from New York. Uh, he's in the process of finding a two-bedroom apartment because he has a friend who's in the military in North Africa, and when he, he gets out, he's moving here too. Uh, that's going to happen in, in August, right? Uh, that's the kind of stuff that, that we keep track of. Answer your question? Um, I mean, the things that I can point to that I, I'm really pleased that we've created because we're really, you know, we're not, this is the big confusion about Amsterdam, right? Like, we don't make apps, we're just app makers getting together and, and, and helping each other. And a lot of people have made a lot of things of varying levels of success. Um, you know, we've spent the past year, I think, more observing what people have been doing and less telling people, no, that's wrong, that's crap, that won't sell. Um, because you kind of have to. Uh, the thing is, everybody has their own little projects that they're working on, and uh, you know, telling telling somebody that their project is is not going to be successful uh, when they've only just met you is like telling somebody that their girlfriend is not the right person for them. I mean, it's not going to go over well. Uh, you're just going to have to let them figure these things out for themselves. Uh, but we've we've started to have that. You know, that's happened. Um, what we have had is a lot of uh, events and stuff that have been created because of this. Uh, you know, people coming to these meetings and, and, and hearing the very simple message of, actually, if you have an idea, you can do that. You can build that. It's not, uh, you know, how, how's the, the, the Dutch national anthem go? Uh, uh, it's niet mogelijk. Yeah. We, we, we have the opposite of that, right? Uh, so we've had, for example, uh, this guy had this idea of he wanted to, you know, we have all these hackathons where people get together and build random apps, and he's like, why don't we build non-random apps? Why don't we build apps that are actually, like, going to do some good for the planet, right? Uh, you know, get together with people who run charities who, who, who need apps made and stuff like that. And so he put together this thing now called Apps for the Planet, and, like, they, they have events all over the city. They go around, they, 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 they work on stuff. Um, and, you know, all because of Amsterdam, all because of him coming around the table and talking about his crazy ideas and having us say, you know, yeah, crazy ideas can actually be built, right? And now we have, uh, you know, somebody else who was like, well, in the month of April, we should have, like, a whole festival of app that we'll call it app world. And we're like, yeah, that's a great idea. Go do that. And so, like, now that's, you know, that's, that's exactly how, how, how that went down. Uh, now we have this whole, you know, go to appworld.nl and, and you'll see all the, all the fun stuff that's going on with that. One last question at the back. 
Hi, I'll be quick. Um, firstly, very nice to hear a very positive talk, uh, somebody who thinks they can really make a difference. Um, I guess at the beginning of your talk you said um, you were just looking for somewhere nice to hang out and to live, but was there any particular reason why you picked Amazon, like a challenge? Or... Uh, yes, uh, I mean there's a couple of reasons. Uh, it really just kind of seemed like the place. Uh, <laughs> You know, one of the things that I, that I discovered in, in my travels is that there's a lot of different places that have a lot of, you know, really good about one thing, really bad about another thing. Uh, but you had some places where they were really just an attempt to take the best of everything and kind of combine it. Uh, the, the, the two best examples of that I found in the world were, uh, were Disney World in Florida and Amsterdam. <laughs> and the VOC were a lot better, I think, than Walt Disney at, at, at constructing something like this. So Amsterdam is kind of a better example. And, but the other thing is that Disneyland, it's all very sterile. It's all very controlled. It's all very fake. Whereas here, there's a, there's a, a genuineness to things. And there's, you know, it's, I, I describe it sometimes as a Disney world blended with Burning Man because there's a, there's a little bit of a, a you know, Two, two colliding ideas uh, put together. You have a lot of freedom, but then you also have just a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, it's relatively cheap, right? Uh, we don't like to think of Amsterdam as cheap, uh, you know, especially by Dutch standards. But by world standards, it's really cheap. You know, when people say, why not London? Why not Tokyo? Why not New York? It's like, because you have to pay like four times as much as anywhere else to live in those places. Uh, whereas in Amsterdam, it's actually, you know, it, it's like the, the median price. Like it costs about the same amount to live here than it does in Seattle. The weather's actually nicer here than it is in Seattle. Um, it's really easy for an American, and that's who 90% of the skilled technologists are at this point, uh, to come here. Everybody speaks English, and willingly, right? And it's, it, it's no little thing. Right? Like, uh, you know, Italy, for example, Spain. They would love to have a bunch of technologists there, but they're not going to. You know why? Because they don't speak English good enough. Right? And, like, I, I'm not trying to be a dick. They need to learn better English if they want to be in technology, because technology happens in English. It's just how it is. You know, except in France, it, it's all happening in English. Um, and, and, and so, you know, part of, part of being welcoming to technology is that, I mean, the cultural mismatches, Barcelona, for example, has spent millions of euro uh, to try to increase their technology footprint. But, but the culture of Barcelona, right? Imagine an American moving to Spain. Visiting Spain for a week, fantastic. It's lovely, it's very relaxing. But if you lived there as an American, nothing's open? Like, what is going on in this place? You have to wait until, you know, 10 o'clock at night to eat dinner? There's no way that that's going to work, right? The Dutch, for all their eccentricities, it's a pretty, it's a pretty reasonable impotence match, right? I mean, it, you know, things are... It's very reminiscent in the Netherlands of what we like to fantasize the United States used to be like. You know, we have this, this ideal version of the U.S., this kind of naive idea of when people were nice to each other and you didn't have fences around everything, and that's, that's what this is here. Uh, you know, Berlin, fantastic city, right? Everybody loves Berlin. Everybody in Europe says, why not Berlin? Uh, when you go to the immigration office in Berlin, they will only speak German. How is that going to work? Right? I mean, that kind of bullshit is the reason why it doesn't work in the U.S. Because I had a hell of a hard time getting international geniuses into the U.S. because U.S. immigration is a big pain in the ass. Dutch immigration, piece of cake compared to that. Even, you know, with, with all of the recent anti-immigration stuff, it's still way easier to get into the Netherlands than it is to not only get into the U.S., but anywhere else in Europe. So, uh, you know, it's, it's things like that, riding your bike around. Uh, you know, it, it, it's such a nice thing. It's just, it's appealing to people. It's easy to get to, and more than anything else, what Dutch cities have that no other cities in the world have is gezelligheid. <laughs> it's a real thing. People come here, they feel at home, and that's what makes it a good home for people. Thanks, Mike. So what will you decide in the first year of night left? Yeah? Next week? So, um, Thanks for your great and positive uh, talk. Don't, don't, don't break up just yet. Because uh, there's one aspect of Amsterdam, one of the nice things you said about it uh, that you haven't mentioned. And on that note, I would like to uh, give to you, on the other nerd night, the real Amsterdam, Sin City. Give him a hand, guys.